All right, thank you so much, Erica. Welcome everybody. It's a real privilege to uh, be able to present to everybody. So I'm sure everybody's been enjoying this wonderful conference. So uh, let's get started. Um, so purpose of today's presentation, um, I created a, a website um, full of intervention materials called The Mind. It stands for the Measures and Interventions of Numeracy Development. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about how to access materials for Tier 1. Um, you're going to see uh, after about slide 26 or something, there's a whole nother presentation that is Tier 2. I won't get to that today, but it's in the, but basically you'll have access to the handout um, to, to, to see that. Um, I'm going to provide a scope and sequence of keystone skills with performance criteria. Um, we're going to talk about how to assess and match intervention materials to uh, student needs and how to incorporate explicit timing in a group setting to support tier one skills. And then we're going to talk lastly a little bit about how to set goals and determine mastery criteria to support tiered decision making. And so uh, again, given a limited amount of time, I I'm really just going to talk about a, a school wide um, implementation of fact practice, daily fact practice. And so let's get started. Um, does computation fluency really matter? Uh, this is a hot topic. I, I'm not exactly sure why. It seems fairly clear to me that it would be important that when you have tool skills and things like basic facts that you will have to use throughout the rest of your mathematical life, um, that it would be important that you were fast and accurate. Um, and so I'm starting out with a case. And so it was a school. Um, in Oklahoma and it contacted the uh, I work at Oklahoma State University and it and they contacted a colleague of mine Gary Duhon and they were about um, uh, they're low in their math achievement so there was around six schools in the district they were the lowest um, school in the district lowest SES that type of situation and so basically we were we proposed to the school uh, that we implement facts on fire and it's a tier one supplement so all students receive it and it's simply daily time practice and basic skills for four minutes per day um, to increase fact fluency so what it is not it's not comprehensive and it's not balanced math instruction right and so uh you know I, and when i say that i just when we go into schools we're not saying this is going to you know supplant your curriculum this is you got your curriculum in place let's do this every day we'll see if this helps or not right so the primary question here was uh, would a systematic with a systemic focus on building fact fluency actually result in broad incre in increases in broad math skills so is it worth the time uh to spend practicing our math facts and doing the dreaded time test all right, so the goals of the program is to build fluent responding across computation skills. And to do this, we would just required four minutes of practice per day, grades one through five. Uh, we did daily practice across a specific scope and sequence. Uh, the problem that schools get into, and I think a mountain to climb for most classroom teachers, is these mile wide and inch deep curricula. The National Math Advisory Panel pointed this out. We're simply trying to teach too much um, and too little a time, and so we get so we really don't spend time adequate time building fluency in some of these skills. Um, all students were assessed and placed in instructional level skills. So this is differentiated across students. Um, time tests have a bad rap. Um, people talk about how they cause math anxiety. Um, I have a three and a five-year-old, and uh, every now and again, I just go and I show them a stopwatch, and they've never had an anxiety attack. So I don't think it's the stopwatch causing it. But if you put, if you misplace kids in, in frustration level material and you time them, that will be a negative experience. It will cause anxiety if that is the case. And so let's be smart about using assessment and appropriately placing kids. Um, <clears throat> students were moved across the skill sequence when they reached mastery criteria. And we typically set this around 30 to 40 digits correct per minute. And so our goal was to help students 
access and actively participate in the core curriculum. So again, by no means did we think we were teaching conceptual understanding. That wasn't our goal. Our goal was to try and build prior knowledge of tool skills or basic foundational skills so that when the teacher was teaching procedural fluency, conceptual understanding, that the child had those uh, cornerstone skills to where you know, they could focus in on that. All right, so implementation and evaluation. Uh, we did this a long time ago to how time flies when you're having fun. We started in 2010 and 11, and we evaluated this through the 13, 14 school year. Uh, it was implemented around 150 days a year with 300 students. Uh, this totaled about 600 total uh, instructional minutes and uh, minutes and it was 10 hours of supplemental instruction per year we evaluated its effects using state test scores and we compared uh, two other schools in the district uh, just to kind of evaluate here's what we found and so school a was your rich school that was the highest performing school in the district and um, as you see um, they had math investigations as their core curriculum, and they got rid of it. And so around this time, you see kind of everybody went up because they went to a, a new curriculum that apparently was better for their population. Um, here was the other title school, and here was our target school that we did uh, the Facts on Fire with. Now, I want you guys to see, um, you know, there was no effect the first year. We were a bit nervous. But then the second year, we found some good effects, third year even better, and then we really found good effects. The reason for this is these were state tests, I think, for third graders, right? And so these third grade kids right here, they got about five or six months of fact practice. And then you go to the second year, these kids had a year in six months. These kids had two years in six months of just this daily fact practice. And so when you get to here, right, this was, uh, kids got to print, like we, we really debugged the system and had a good thing going. And so obviously uh, if you are a first grader in this year, second grader, third grader. And so again, and I underscore this, if you think you're going to go in and do these types of interventions for a week or two, um, it's just, or you do it a couple of days a week, it's just not going to have the effect. This needs to be something, um, you know, that is done every day and that there's a concerted effort in the school. And so again, and look at this, they went from proficient to advanced on the state test. And we did this with 10 hours of instruction. Uh, per year across four years. And so the pretest is the average of these two baseline data points. And then the post test is that final. And if you look, the non title uh, school, um, so the, the, the kind of high SES school in the district grew 48 points on the state test. The uh, other, other low SES school grew 12, and the school we were in grew 101. And so what did it cost? It was four minutes a day. Right, four minutes a day, 160 days, 10.7 hours per year. Uh, why did the students at the target school increase their math achievement? All right, so this is usually if I'm at a, if I'm presenting in person, I would get your responses. Um, this is important. Um, the reason that the students made gains, in in, in my opinion is that we simply, we decreased the instructional mismatch between grade level skills and what the kids were coming in with. Because we gave them those tool skills and the foundational skills, the teachers didn't change how they taught over the four years. They used the same curriculum because they were done with math investigations by the time we started. Um, they didn't change, the kids' prior knowledge changed. And so that basically allowed and empowered the teachers to be more effective because, again, they were focused on teaching procedures. How do we use skills and, con and concepts? Why and in what situations do we use skills? But when students didn't have the prerequisite skills to engage in those two uh, aspects of the instructional environment, they just lost a lot of effect. And so um, takeaways. I'm not saying that uh, basic fact uh, fluency is the world's most important thing. And that if we have a kid 
passed with this math fact that we're done. I'm saying the exact opposite. It provides a foundation, right? Mastery of facts uh, basically appeared, at least, to provide students access to the core curriculum. It enabled teachers to do their job. It allowed teachers to focus on, I think, the more higher order uh, things of mathematics that, you know, the, uh, you know we, we see a lot about what the NCTM talks about and the flexibility and the conceptual understanding and different uh, strategies. Um, to me, having a good base of memorized tool skills, whether that be number writing, number identification, basic facts, um, you know, all set the stage for kids across the re uh, representative grades, I think, to, uh, uh, to respond to that, uh, to those instructional goals much better. Um, critical skill fluency and broad math achievement are not dichotomous. Uh, for whatever reason, and some, uh, you know, some people talk like if you memorize a basic fact that that is going to preclude you from conceptually understanding it. I'm not sure. Uh, what our data showed with this was the exact opposite. And so, uh, you know, what, what I'm here to talk about today is getting away from the mile wide and the inch deep and focusing on a narrow band of skills. Uh, this is plausible and it's efficient and can be done to get those kind of state test score increases in 10 hours of instruction per year, I think, is something that uh, we were pretty proud of and, uh, and, is, and encouraged by. So that's kind of a story to start out. Like to me, that should fire people up. Um, you know, we're all in here to help kids. And this is a pretty simple, low cost way that, you know, according to these state test data, really had a, a positive impact on these students. So what is the mind? It's uh, measures and interventions for numeracy development. And uh, there was a need for a coherent set of instructional materials delivered using empirically validated instructional approaches. All right, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I worked as a school psych a long time ago, right? Like 15, 16 years ago. This was back in the in the day when we had dibbles. And, and anyway, we could go to the, I remember getting to go to websites and print off materials. And then like Pearson bought everything or these different testing companies monetized all this. And I was like, I, I don't know where to go to get materials. So I'm out consulting in schools and I don't know where to get assessment materials, intervention materials. And then like going to teachers and saying like, do cover copy compare or do this intervention and not having the curricular supports that they need, the integrity forms, the training forms. Um, you know, I just was like, what? I mean, this is crazy. Like it, 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 it and so I was like, you know, I'm a professor now, I'm gonna create this and I'm gonna give it away for free, right? Now, again, if there's any testing companies out there that wants to give me millions of dollars, by all means, um, I, I guess I would. But my point being is, is, you know, I'm doing this because I wanna help kids. Kids need free resources, teachers need free resources. And so that's why I created the mind. And I felt that people, um, you know, again, I would go ahead and we would give these different recommended practices, but I wouldn't have cur uh, curricular resources for teachers to run the interventions. And so, um, you know, I wanted to create a standard um, protocol approach. And um, that's the way we roll. We got some questions here. Uh, have you published your findings in a journal? Um, the mind, I mean, it's all explicit timing and, and cover, copy, compare. Um, I have a data set. I haven't published it yet on specifically the mind. Um, and so it should be presented soon. Uh, but every component of, um, of the mind is, is uh, you know, is based off of, of studies. And I can send you those individual studies I've done on explicit timing, cover, copy, compare, tape problems, um, if you guys want those. Okay, so goal was to provide teachers, school psychologists, consultants, uh, interventionists with free resources to support quality instruction. And so anyway, here's the website. So the uh, location here is factsonfire.com and also brianponce.wixsite.com. Um, again, purpose, uh, provide education, ed educators with resources to supplement core instruction, uh, targets uh, target skills are early numeracy, basic fact, 
and multi-digit uh, computation. Again, this isn't a curriculum. It's not an end-all, be-all to everything. It is simply, it's important that kids memorize their basic facts. And I wanted to provide research-based materials um, to do it as efficiently as possible. And so all of these uh, facts on fire, we recommend four minutes a day. Uh, the, the skill remediation starts at about 10 minutes a day. And of course, sometimes you'll need to double that dose. Uh, but again, it's not to, you know, it, it's, again, it is to help teachers uh, supplement the curriculum. And again, it's everything's free. So what's this provide schools? It provides a critical skill scope and sequence, uh, provides performance standards and mastery criteria. Um, assessments explicitly guide student placement uh, and interventions uh, based off of accuracy and fluency patterns and student responding across this kind of limited scope and sequence of critical skills. Um, intervention procedures and materials are all empirically supported and uh, designed for efficient grouping and differentiation. And so if you go to the skill remediation probes, they're all two minute standard protocol. It usually goes cover, copy, compare, explicit timing, cover, copy, compare, explicit timing for kids that struggle, right? For the remedial stuff. Um, and then obviously explicit timing is, is just uh, is practice. And I do that because you could technically have three kids on sums to 18, three kids on multiplication three. I mean, you can have kids on all different skills and because you're doing two minute, two minute, two minute, they know whether it's cover, copy, compare, explicit timing. And so every, so you can provide this to two kids, five kids, 10 kids, 30 kids at a time. And, um, uh, you know, and, and you can fully differentiate uh, specifically what is being worked on. And so the solution, um, create a standard protocol approach to build computation fluency. So getting started uh, consists of two instructional sets. And like I said earlier, I only have time to really talk about one. So I'm gonna talk about the, the tier one instruction to promote computation development. Uh, again, I have uh, my PowerPoints for tier two. And so you guys can look at those and again, if anyone ever wants to email me with questions or comments, feel free to do it. Um, always love talking interventions, and uh, and so don't hesitate. All right. So planning for the mind. Uh, so determine need for school-wide implementation. So I mean, the, the basic question, right, is should your school invest time and resources to build school-wide computation fluency? And so the first thing that schools need to do is examine and determine a critical scope and sequence. And, uh, and this is, again, focus on a few skills for mastery. And I think this is really important for two reasons. For one, you know, I don't know how much second grade teachers talk to third grade teachers who talk to fourth grade teachers. And I don't know that they've had this understanding of here are the core skills. Like when a kid enters my classroom at the beginning of second grade, this is what I need this child to know. And that's what, you know, that's how you need to, to set that skill, um, you know, that skill scope and sequence. The second thing, not to pick on testing companies, but, you know, so everything's been bought out and now we're going to these larger composite skills, computer based uh, assessments, and they are strong predictors and screeners. Uh, but if when I go to interventionists or teachers, I'll be like, well, what exactly does your Ames Web test? Right. And I'll say what problems are on there. And if you if you can't say what problems the kid was assessed on, you cannot do a problem analysis. So while you can flag a kid that he's struggling, um, you know, and that's an important question, um, you still need to have these supplemental resources to really go and do some detailed diagnostic assessment for intervention. Right. And so if we don't know the critical scope and sequence, we don't know where to start, where to slice back, um, determine, you know, those uh, criteria. And so that's an important uh, first step. Uh, second is evaluate your district data. Right. So look at your state test scores um, or I'm sorry, uh, look at your, your, your district wide assessment. 
do the assessments that the teachers want. Like if the teachers are like, this is what it, the kid needs to know in first grade, second grade, third grade, that needs to probably match your district wide assessment. Right. And then you ask yourself, are kids meeting those broad achievement goals? There's where you bring in your state test performance. And so if the state perform state, if the state test performance isn't good, then you know, you kind of ask yourself, why not? Um, so core curriculum could be an issue, right? But to me, every single school I've ever stepped foot into my entire life and assessed, students were not mastering foundational skills. And what's this mean? Probably 50 to 60% of all your students in like second, third, and fourth grade are still finger counters. Okay, and what's interesting is sometimes your older kids will memorize multiplication division, but they're still finger counting uh, addition and subtraction. Um, so if you go and you're in your in your because remember when we built those core skills, our state taught uh, test scores shot up. And so my guess is if you assess and these teachers are like a kid needs to be able to do this by this time, um, you will find that student achievement levels are not being met in regards to um, skill fluency. And again, a brief four minute intervention each day could be a great use of resources in order to, uh, you know, try to supplement those core curricula out there um, to show some increased achievement for students. Okay, so um, there's an attachment and it has the instructional hierarchy, it has a skill scope and sequence and, uh, and then it has criteria on it. Um, so after you determine the need for the school, now you need to determine whether there's building support. And it's critical that teachers and administration are committed. Remember, if you look at our tier one data, it took three years to really get good effects. And so it's critical that teachers and administrators um, are committed, that they know that fact skill fluency is an important skill for students. Um, I'm in a, I mean, if you've been, if you haven't been living under a rock, you know that there's two camps and there's a camp that really doesn't think that how fast you do things matters. Um, I think the science of reading folks and, you know, like Dr. Kirshner earlier, I think people would, uh, I think a lot of scientists would, would, would agree with me that it's important that these tools, tool skills are known um, to, to uh, mastery. Uh, and so first teachers in the building need to see that this is an important endeavor. It's an important thing to do. And they need to know how to, ensuring fact mastery supports teacher efficacy. And so again, we're not doing this for no reason. We're doing it so that you can run your core curriculum and kids will be able to access and respond to it better. And you need to know that increasing computation skills supports the end goal of broad math achievement. And so again, by no means am I saying all that other stuff, don't worry about it, it's all about facts. Again, facts are the gateway, facts are the foundation. Give kids a chance to be great mathematicians. You know, don't let them be a sixth grade finger counter. So uh, big ideas and major staff roles, appropriate place students and in instructional level practice material. Ensure all students practice for at least four minutes a day. And uh, interestingly, there is research out there uh, by my colleague, Dr. Duhon, and uh, he showed that if you practice your facts um, every other day, they didn't grow. You had to do it every day. And so again, we're not saying to spend 10 minutes a day, four minutes a day. If you do it every day, it has a great cumulative effect. All right, uh, student work needs to be scored each week uh, to guide what the student practices next. Uh, teachers need to ensure effort and fidelity. And when I say this, a lot of times, if a, if a teacher isn't committed, if they don't feel fact uh, instruction or fact fluency is important, if they think time tests are bad, a lot of times they'll sit at their desk and not do anything. If kids see that teachers don't care, um, the kids aren't going to be engaged. And so, you know, teachers need to be up cheerleading students, making sure they're they're trying their best and uh, just see the importance, kids pick up on that. And then administration needs a person to oversee logistics. So printing and packet dis dissemination. And we'll get in a little, a little later here to what that specifically looks like. But again, 
got to have building support and everybody needs to a think and know it's important and then also uh, people need to be aware of what's expected all right so implementation first thing you assess and place students in instructional level skill so here you got to know the skill scope and sequence and so again facilitate communication within and across grades and um, you know students um, you know again what skills are needed by students when they enter the grade to access instruction and then students should be instructional or mastery across the previous year's skill if not then we probably need to go to you know some more uh, higher dosage skill remediation activities and if you see a lot of kids then instead of doing four minutes a day maybe you need to do eight minutes a day so you do it in the morning you do it in the afternoon but you wouldn't know until you know you began to put this in in, in place and, and and see how students were responding so assess each student so initially you assess each student across the scope and sequence and determine instructional level so what well, you know, what do they have mastered? So, in a, you know, where are they instructional and what are they frustration on? Go to the lowest skill that hasn't been mastered and start there and print out booklet using links at the bottom of the page. So probe sets by skill and there's a link there. So here is my proposed, at least what we used uh, when we um, did this. So K-1 through uh, fourth grade. And again, I have uh, grade ranges on here, um, you know, but again, this isn't gonna match up to every curriculum. Um, it's important that people have those uh, conversations and make sure that it does. And then also I want people to recognize these optional tasks. I think the cover copy compare with fact families is important excuse me and also close problems so algebraic equations blank plus six is 11 five plus what's 14. um so you know kids memorize those you know like six plus nine is 15 but then when you begin to present it in different ways do they get that you want to teach part part whole relationships um and so i think those are good ways to kind of supplement kind of the depth and, and provide some different types of practice there so uh, start, you obviously don't test the kid off of all of these. You assess the students on things they've already been taught. Remember, this isn't new instruction. This is reteaching what they already should know so that they can build uh, fluency. And so you start with grade level targets. You move back if a, a skill of fluency criteria is not met. You move forward when the fluency criteria is met. Um, when you're in a skill that is mastered, um, you know, when you're in that skill and you finally hit the mastery criteria, you move forward. All right. Uh, so the great, like I said, grade grade ranges um, indicates when skill should be taught, but it should be matched to uh, curriculum. Um, a word on the critical skill sequence. Um, it will not overlap with all skills taught in the core curriculum. Again, it was to really focus on those tool skills and targets, uh, and targets, numbers, and operations. Um, I view math like if reading's a triangle where everything leads up to reading comprehension. I've always said that math is like a tree, and the trunk of the tree is your numbers and operations, right? Because when you get older, a branch can go to geometry. It can go to calculus, it could go to algebra, it could go to statistics. Those things aren't all, you know, those things are different sometimes. But the one thing you have um, across all of those is you need to know your have your numbers and operations down. And so to me, um, you know, building that trunk uh, to, to support that foundation uh, is, is of, uh, is of uh, paramount importance. Um, this critical skill sequence is not exhaustive. Um, I'm not meaning it to be. Uh, to me, if a kid can get to fourth grade and do all their basic facts, be able to do fact families, close problems, and multi-digit um, uh, multi-digit problems across the four operations, um, I I'm, would be very happy if you know 80% of our kids could get there. 
Uh, and these component skills that I'm talking about support teaching more complex procedures and, con and concepts. And so if a kid is automatized in their basic facts, it's going to make teaching word problems easier, place value easier, estimation easier. Um, even if you want to teach a doubles plus one, right, or a making 10 strategies, these are strategies that some of my critics uh, or critics of these uh, memorization approaches have, uh, which I don't understand why, because I think if I'm right, they have to memorize or recall the strategy. And uh, and so apparently memorization is OK for procedures, but not uh, declarative facts, which has always been a bit confusing to me. All right. Standards for moving across skills uh, were set using subskill mastery estimates. And uh, and again, feel free to include other critical skills and create measures and intervention materials. Um, work. We, uh, I got a team that's kind of working on this. And we're um, continually trying to develop new materials um, as well. And, and again, this should empower the school. If there's something that's not on the scope and sequence that they that you know that they want added, or there's something on there that they disagree with, or it doesn't match their curriculum, I just want people to have those conversations. Figure out what you want to assess, assess it, test it, see if it works. All right. So management of materials. Um, so schools need to provide re, uh, resources for a coordinator to manage materials. Um, this shouldn't be left to um, individual teachers to do. I just think that it's it's a little overkill. Um, but you have a coordinator. They know the website. They understand the decision making criteria. Here's weekly tasks that that manager would have to do. So schedule weekly data collection. Right. So basically, they know that every Wednesday or Thursday, whatever it is, that's when you score each student's uh, probe. And when you would do that, right, that the teacher would need to score those, put the, uh, you know, put the student score on a data record form um, to provide progress. Um, what this does is when it's handed to the manager, it allows them to know, do you reprint or do you print a similar booklet or do you move to the next skill, right? Um, if you do this over weeks and, uh, and, and kids flatline, then that will play into those decisions as well. Uh, booklets are labeled and provided to teachers to put into the, the student folder on Friday. So if you think about it, you collect data on Wednesday or Thursday. You figure out, um, you know, where the kid's fluency score is, which informs what booklet to print out. You print it out, you redistribute it to each of the teacher. They stuff the folder. The kid has a folder um, in their desk on Monday morning, ready to go for their daily fact practice. Okay, so how do we Ryan, ensure? Yes, Brian, I'm going to interrupt real quick. There was a question uh, with regards to what you were just speaking to, um, and the question is, do you have that record form prepared? I don't, I could make one. I mean, basically it would just be a class, uh, you know, a, a class, um, you know, class list. Uh, I, I'll go ahead and I'll write that down and I'll make one. And I'll get that to you guys. Uh, but when we used it, it was basically just a class list. And then, uh, you know, and then on the top, you know, based on the grade, there is uh, usually four to five different skills and you just have an X, which skill. Right. So it would just be like if the kid was at 34 digits correct per minute, then the person knew just to reprint that. If they were popped to 43, then they'd know to go to the next skill in the sequence. And so we just had, again, a class list by the grade level skills. All right, so uh, fluency building is short in duration, high in intensity. It needs to be done at least one time per day. And the way, the only way we could get this to work, right, was we had to incorporate it into morning announcements. Because if you leave it up to up to kids or up to the teachers, I mean, they're they're so swamped and they're so you know between assemblies and everything else. And this is where you got to have that school level buy-in. And so every day. Uh, you know, at the, with the morning announcements, they would go through them all, and then it would just say, get out your folders, you're going to do your, you know, facts on fire, and they would read the directions, and then they, they, they would have a two-minute timing, and then another two-minute timing. 
And so again, teacher needs to engage students to give maximum effort. Uh, talk with students about effort and improvement. Again, it is so important that teachers value fluency building and show that to the students. Um, again, it's very important to um, talk with students about effort and practice and their ability to, uh, you know, to, to, to learn and to be effective. Okay. Okay, uh, a word on time tests and the use and misuse as, a, as an instructional tool. Um, time tests, um, the research is unequivocal that it works. Um, antecedent timing procedures, uh, Van Houten did it back in 1978, uh, 76 or 78. Um, we, it's been shown over and over again. If you give people limited a amount of time, their opportunities to respond will improve. And that being said, we need to be careful to put kids in instructional level materials. And, and, and that's important. Now, the other thing is that sometimes when kids are strategy dependent, um, you know, they'll look slow and accurate, right? I mean, so they'll be at 16 or 18 digits correct, 100%. And I've seen it where when I timed them, right, all of a sudden the kid was pushing themselves to go faster. So they started screwing up their counting procedures. And so, and this is why, now, now this would have been, you know, this is less than 5% of the population, but that's why teachers get a little frustrated with time tests because they will see the kid that breaks down and cries. That's usually because they're put in the wrong, uh, wrong instructional level material. Um, but even like this certain student, they just all of a sudden their accuracy plummeted because they started counting wrong. Again, this is why teachers need to score things every day, right? Like look at your students, watch what they do, see how they're doing things and interact with them. Um, time tests are not the panacea of instruction, right? It's just a good way to build fluency. And again, I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old and um, they love it when I time them, but I'll time them to do things like run and get me a soda or I'll like say, how many times can you jump up and down? Right. It's not frustrating until I'm like, you have five minutes to clean up as many toys as you can. And when it's high effort, they don't like it. It's common sense. Right. Again, timing never hurt anybody. If I show my kids a stopwatch, they're not having an anxiety attack. But if you pair that with adverse stimuli, then obviously that gets conditioned. And so uh, just to understand time test in anxiety. And, and, and you know, as, a, as psychologists, we realize the gold standard for anxiety treatment is exposure therapy. And so even if time tests uh, apparently was the culprit, uh, the, the recommended way to treat that would actually be uh, systematic desensitization. So I don't really get where people come from uh, criticizing time tests. Um, again, it needs to be used the right way with the right level of instructional material. If a kid can already do it um, and they're, they're accurate, then it's probably safe to say that a time test will be effective. Brian, a question coming through uh, regarding uh, if you have a comment on programs such as Moby Max for fact practice. I have not heard of that. This is what I look for with fact practice. Um, especially for your tier two and your tier three kids. Set size means everything, right? So for example, the, 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 the worksheets on the mind, if you look at them, there's no zeros and ones. Well, that probably doesn't seem like a big deal, but zeros and ones account for about 33% of all the problems. Those are rule governed, most kids know them. So why are we having kids practice things they already know? That was 33 OTRs that we just wasted time, right? Here's some other interesting things we know. So you take those out, boom, now you got like 60, uh, you know, you got um, about 72 problems left. But then you got five plus nine and you got nine plus five. And what we know it generally is that reciprocals in addition multiplication and division will generalize. They don't in subtraction, um, which is which is odd. Um, but if we think about it that way, 
If you want to teach math fact fluency, you take out the zeros and the ones, you take out the reciprocals, it leaves you with 36 problems to teach. Right. And so I don't know when I look at fact practice programs, what I look at is set. So the mind, um, like when you're doing facts on fire, you would start off maybe on all 36 problems. Right. And then if you didn't make progress, we have those broke down into three sets of 12. But again, like when I when I and I work with severe and profound students like ID, I may go down to like four items with like 12 repetitions to get them to memorize their facts and it'll work. Right. And so practice works, but the ratio of how much time the dose you're going to do, what your set size is and the amount of repetitions is important. And so the mind uh, I've developed that to kind of uh, keep those types of uh, those types of things in mind. It's all just kind of pre bought in, but I'm not just randomizing math facts and having kids practice them. Very thoughtful about what problems are on there, how they're sequenced, and the mastery criteria. When you look at uh, and there's uh, there can be great math programs out there. Um, if I were evaluating them, if they're not controlling for set and they're not thinking about dose. So how much time am I gonna give? How many repetitions? Think about it this way. We know that, that, that stimulus response feedback and flashcard interventions are effective, right? But if you sit there and you go through the entire deck one time, no kid's gonna learn it, right? So, but if you take five flashcards, if a kid doesn't know any of them, you do five and you do two times through, a kid's probably not gonna learn it. But if you do five and you do maybe six repetitions, maybe the kid will, right? And let's say the kid gets that easy. You may be able to go, that was around 30 OTRs. So you may be able to go up to eight and do four. And then if the kid can make eight, then you would know that was great. If you did five rep if five items with, or six items with five repetitions and they didn't get it, you could go down to five items with six repetitions or you could go down to four items um, again, with, with 10 repetitions. You get my point? Like if you had a finite amount of time, you need to understand what you're trying to increase, how much time you you have to do it, and how many items. And so that to me, when a child doesn't respond, it's usually because the set size is too big or the amount of time to practice is too small. And so I don't know that a lot of these online programs really think in that depth about these types of things. And there's virtually little to no research on appropriate dosage and set size. I published something in 2022, I believe, uh, but people just really haven't looked at it. But if we think about across the tiers, you could do the same intervention. If you do it more, sometimes that's what it takes and it just takes more. Sometimes you need to reduce the set in the same kind of instruction Will, will be effective. And so again, um, programs, if they do that, they're going to be good. If they don't, it may be a waste of time. So weekly scoring and decision making is of high importance. So student performance needs to be scored at least once per week. And, and this is the pushback I get from teachers. I don't have time to score it. Um, but it's so important to score. Um, student performance guides decision making. Do we move up a skill? Do we move down a skill? Right. Like the one girl that I uh, was talking about that totally, you know, she got to try to do things too fast and she started to respond inaccurately. We needed to get in right away. Right. And do some reteaching on that. If we don't score um, and we don't look at progress, we won't know those things. Um, provide feedback to students about performance. Self graphing is important. Uh, provides context for the teacher to talk with the student about setting goals, effort, and progress. Um, you know, one of the things with math is a lot of students, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of a lot of students are intimidated by math because they haven't had a lot of success with it. And so, you know, increasing those attributions that I'm smart, I can do math. I just need to practice and kind of control those confines, give them that opportunity to be successful, show them very concretely you're getting better, um, give them high fives, make them feel good about math. I think those are important things. Cues the teacher to celebrate progress. 
right? Teachers should be high-fiving kids, um, excited that they're getting better with math. Um, instructional level work allows that student to show off skills, have fun with math, right? Like there's people that will say we shouldn't do homework. Homework has negative effects. Well, yeah, when you're sending a kid home with homework and he doesn't know how to do it and his parent doesn't know how to do it, it's not a very fun situation. But if you send a kid home with something and the parent gets to sit down with him and he can show off how good he's doing, how fast he can do it, uh, things that he's already done before, he's very clear about uh, what is being done, that's how homework and fluency building should be done. It should be pleasurable, it should be fun, it should, uh, again, allow the teacher to praise the child, the parent to praise the child. And so, again, assessment is key. Um, instructional level, uh, okay, so uh, if a student flatlines or regresses, teachers can investigate why. I'm, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not in the dark on this. These uh, programs can be boring. Cover, copy, compare is boring. Explicit timing gets boring, right? If we don't attach games to it, uh, reinforcers to it, these things will get dry very quickly. Um, and, and that's okay. So sometimes kids will just flatline or regress because they're just like, nobody cares. Why do I do this every day? And so again, it's so imperative to provide feedback to that student on performance. And again, if, if the child flatlines or regresses and you see that they're accurately responding, that just shouldn't happen, right? Because opportunities to respond should lead to increased fluency. So last thing, teacher can score or use a key to allow students to score. I don't have a problem with that. Now, even if you do that, you still probably want to do spot checks. Look at the first line. Is the kid responding accurate? Because remember, kids shouldn't be placed in these types of practice materials if they're inaccurate. So if you start seeing below 90% accuracy, right, like you know like something's up. Again, maybe they've regressed on accounting strategy. Um, you know, maybe, maybe they're just bored and guessing. And so you pull the kid one-on-one, -on -one, you do a can't do, won't do assessment, right? You assess them and then you assess them with reinforcement. And if you see that the uh, student performance uh, significantly uh, increases due to the reinforcement, you know that it wasn't a skill, skill problem, it was simply a performance problem. If you increase it and the child doesn't get any better, then hey, that's showing that the child's not responding to the intervention and you may need to increase dose or, you know, go and try some different things in order to increase the efficacy of the program for that student. We had two quick questions in the chat. Yes. One you just addressed, um, can we have students score and teachers provide feedback? And you just addressed that. The next question was, do you have blank student graphs for your program? <laughs> I don't, but I can I can get those too. I'm sorry. That's all right. Was, yeah. Um, actually, I think I do. I, I haven't. Uh, the website, I did the website a long time ago, and I need to update it. I, I keep begging them to let me do a sabbatical so I can do some of these things. But, uh, you know, again, free sites, uh, it's it's hard to, to keep up. Um, but uh, um, when I get done with this, we should have some extra time. And while I'm fielding questions, I'll get on the website. I can share screen and show people what that looks like. And, and I'll see if I, there's not a graph on there. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Okay, so conclusions. Um, establish a scope and sequence of critical skills. Uh, provide repeated practice with reinforcement to increase fluent responding. Um, require daily implementation across all classrooms. So again, it's so important that you do it right after those morning announcements. Uh, require weekly monitoring to inform target skill selection. And uh, again, implementation uh, across grades leads to significant school-wide achievement gains. Um, that's what we've shown. And uh, uh, again, um, to me, uh, most, uh, most teachers and administrators, I mean, you can't tell me a fourth grade teacher wouldn't be excited to get kids with less skill deficits in their basic skills so they can kind of target, um, you know, what they're supposed to do in those, uh, 
in, in those core skills. All right, uh, comments and questions. Uh, there's a new new question in the chat. Uh, is the data published? The data for what? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> no, that is not. Um, I have a problem. Um, I keep collecting data and I'm not writing it up as fast as I should. Um, it is on um, our radar to write these data up. It's clearly quasi experimental, right? Like it's not, I mean, actually, it's non experimental. Um, and so uh, whether we'll get it published, I don't know. Um, it's powerful data, but it, it's, you know, we didn't do a random, we didn't do an RCT on it. Uh, you know, we, we went in just to consult and help with the, uh, with the school. And also I'm, I'm it's, it's, uh, more than happy to, uh, you know, to let people ask me questions as compared to typing. If it's okay, then I will uh, select to let participants unmute themselves. Great. I have that box checked, so it should be unchecked now. So participants, if you do want to ask a question, you should have the capability to unmute. One just popped in the chat. Olivia School Psych, hello. A previous question that was not addressed yet is one that I also have. Are there any data to demonstrate the efficacy or lack thereof of tech-based fact fluency programs? Um. Yeah, the data on computer assisted instruction is there. Um, it, it definitely can work. Some will work better than others. Um, you know, and so again, to me, the modality that it is uh, practiced, um, you know, actually with the mind, um, we are in the process of developing a uh, basically cover, copy, compare and explicit timing and tape problems all online. So we'll basically have an app that will be, you know, basically it scores your kid, it puts them where they need to go. That will be free as well. Uh, we're keeping everything open access. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I, we're running a dissertation this year where we're actually doing paper pencil versus this computer program. And we're gonna assess uh, the effects on both paper pencil and computer uh, because uh, there's been research in the past where um, if you practice on computer, it will not generalize to paper pencil. And, uh, and, and uh, do, again, Gary Duhon uh, did some great research on that where he showed if you uh, work on a computer and do computer fact practice and you one day a week do a related paper pencil, that then it will generalize. But if you don't do it, it won't generalize. And he replicated it, so he showed two. Okay. Prime. Yeah, the intensive intervention resources um again i put that thinking um i would do it um the, the interventions are going to stay the same it's going to be more time or less um less items and so for example it, it probably like what i need to put on there is sums to 10 cover copy compare you know, start reducing some of those set sizes. I have not done that yet. Um, I have research um, like on tape problems, for example, where we just doubled um, we just doubled the dose and, and what was ineffective with a four minute dose when we went to an eight minute, we got the effect. Like the four minute worked for lots of kids, right? But for some of the kids, they needed a double dose. And so when people ask me how to intensify these resources, I generally tell them uh, add, add reinforcement and add time. Um, I know that's not plausible for everybody. And as soon as I can get on, um, you know, in the computer program, which I'm hoping we'll be able to launch probably a year from now, um, it will have those built in smaller sets. Brian, Michelle asks, how do you get younger grades, such as kindergarten and first grade, to buy into the importance of fact fluency? <laughs> well, uh, it's a great question. So I am going to stop share, and then I'm going to reshare the website. I have a... Oh. 
Okay, so this is the website. So if you go to, uh, so this is the Facts on Fire page, right? And so when you when you scroll down here, here's the scope and sequence. All right, so um, we started at first grade and we would start in about the middle of the year. Um, and so I felt just like you did, who asked the question, we got to do things for young kids too, right? Because that's so important, foundational skills. And so I got an early numeracy skill sequence and probe links, oral counting fluency, number identification fluency, number writing accuracy, number writing fluency. And then numerous skills, we have dot number, dot number total. And then um, I don't have a link to this yet. I need to get that up. Um, but so I have some things for kindergarten. But again, it would be oral count and, and it, it looks different because again, you know, a lot of these are just fluency building skills. Kids in kindergarten haven't learned a whole lot yet. And so it gets a little more uh, difficult. Um, the numeracy skills uh, dot number starts off and I let's see, I think I ripped this off from Amanda Vander Hayden. Um, you know, kids just go, you know, one, two, three, four, and they write a four. Um, she had something called dot circle where it would have uh, like if the kid can't write their numbers yet, it would have dots they could count. And if they could identify numbers, it would have a choice like a three, four or a five. And so these are things kids could could uh, practice. Um, and then when we go to dot number total, um, this is what it looks like. Right. And so kids just count. And then when they so when they can kind of do the number total right, the, or the dot number, when they can see, oh, this is nine dots and write a nine and then a one, and then they could count these up together. And then you obviously you teach uh, vocabulary as far as addition, equal. And so these are some of the resources I have for, um, for early, early numeracy. And then if we go to skill uh, remediation, we have, um, um, you know, we have uh, early numeracy assessments here and then here are uh, oral counting uh, fluency interventions, number identification intervention, uh, number writing accuracy fluency, and then different dot number. And so you got the dot number I showed you, and then dot number total set A you'll see is is more structured. Or, I mean it's unstructured. It's just the dots. And then when we go to set B we begin to kind of mix the two. And so now you have a number and a dot. And then when we go to no, uh, C, um, now you have just two plus two. And if kids want to, they can draw dots out to the side, if, you know, if that, if, if that helps them, right? But basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them to count one-to-one -one correspondence and then fade those supports uh, till eventually they can do uh, sums to 10 in kindergarten. And so again, uh, I got a data set on this. The thing is, is it was one on one and it was pretty intensive instruction. But um, compared to the classroom, the four kids that we worked with um, really uh, at the end of kindergarten were significantly more advanced than the others. Brian, Katrina uh, is, I think, trying to follow along with you on the website. She says, I'm trying to click the graphic with the probe sets by skill, but it's not taking me to the pages you're pulling up. Is there another way to access them? Which skills? Under facts on fire. Okay. So I'm scrolling down like you are and where it says probe sets by skills. Like if oh. I were to click addition to 10, nothing, nothing happens after that. Yeah, I click the one. Okay. Yeah, so oh, basically that works for me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So the basically the one, two, three, and four are four ten worksheet. Um, you know, so if you did two two minutes per day, you would have a kid do, you know, obviously this would give you is four weeks worth of worksheets, is basically what it is across these. Brian, another question has come in. Um, would you recommend using these interventions to help write IEP goals for math? Yes, 
Um, again, my guess, uh, Dr. Vander Hayden's going to present, and I, and I know that she's written some things in the communique about um, uh, GOMS or general outcome measures versus subskill mastery measures. Um, the mind is all subskill mastery measures. Um, you know, I, people, you know, they got star tests and Ames web and all sorts of things out there that kind of broadly screens kids. The point of this really is to help um, performance over time. And so I, one of the things I could do, but I probably won't, was I could create more broad skills, uh, you know, mixed skill probes. Um, to me, I'm, um, you know, I just go from one skill to the next skill to the next skill. But having kids practice things, um, you know, mixing skills together, these, those are great ideas and would be recommended and supported by the by the literature. But this is really um, kind of intervention driven and again, short term, short run, brief, high intense interventions. Looks like we missed a question a few moments ago um, when you were speaking of that generalization um, from uh, digital practice back to the paper, mm. paper mm -hmm. pencil. Um, Diana was wondering if, if the opposite is true, especially when, when thinking about some of the state administered math testing that is done online. Is yes. there any evidence that if your practice is paper-based, yes. it doesn't generalize to the computer? Yes, yeah, so the, the Duhon study showed that uh, the, the paper pencil, it, uh, it, it generalized. It generalized the computer, but that being said, I mean it, it. It generalized the computer fact practice, right? So when we think about state tests, they're usually more applied, um, you know, and just different kinds of questions. And so, but uh, you know what we know, you know, by kind of taking this down to a to a to a micro level, that uh, paper pencil does generalize to a computer, but the vice versa doesn't. Unless again, there's one uh, one one piece of practice on paper pencil for per week. And Beth would like to know if there is one link that would allow uh, someone to print everything from the website. <laughs> there's not, unfortunately. You guys got to, uh, You know, y y I'm 48 years old. Uh, like it, this was uh, this was uh, this is my Mount Rushmore accomplishment that I have this simple of a website. Like all like you're gonna find errors on this, and so what I always tell kids is like I'll give you you know I you know I I, I tell them to catch me being wrong. So because I did all this by because you know like smart people would go to like uh, you know uh, Excel and they would use random things and just spit out probe sets. I created all these just like clicking numbers. And I did that because I wanted to really carefully control the sets and how they were presented. But, uh, and so yeah, all this is is done pretty, <laughs> is pretty, uh, is pretty rudimentary. All right, placement tests. And so the placement tests, um, again, if you go to Facts on Fire, um, and I have, I think, attached the scope and sequence, it just matches this. And so you literally could just print out and use some of these to see if a kid was in an instructional level or not and kind of go back. Does that answer your Compliment. question, Georgia or Jessica? I'm sorry. Oh, oh no, Beth, I'm sorry. Now with tier two, and, I, and again, I don't want to confuse people. But facts on fire is the tier one thing I talked about. Uh, skill remediation is another animal. And so there's a remediation manual. Um, there's uh, basically materials. Uh, so here's the mine placement grid, right? And so it just kind of explains what you do. You just uh, would, would, would do basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And then it has like what uh, booklets to put kids in. And that being said, that's all in the slides I have underneath here that I didn't have uh, time. If they have another one of these conferences, maybe maybe I didn't mess up too bad and they may have me back and I could talk about uh, tier two stuff. Brian, lots of compliments coming through. People are really appreciative of the resources and your presentation. Um, well, I appreciate that. And uh, one of the things I want to show people because this gets me, um, I'm pretty excited about this. 
I mean, this is what I give to my students in my intervention course. But uh, basically, it is, um, if you go through, uh, it talks about riot, basic facts, operations. It goes through uh, the different uh, curriculum-based assessment measures. It has this kind of placement grid. Um, it has all the steps to it. It has a flow chart to where people go and what people do. And then uh, copy, and then it talks about the instructional hierarchy and talks specifically about how to match what intervention given the kids skill profiles as a sample intervention plan. Um, and then on this website somewhere, um, I get I have materials for integrity and um, basically how to's. I should know where these things are, but I don't. So I know there's a lot of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on here. See the manual kind of goes through it. And so if you want to assess in basic facts, uh, Beth asked this. So right here, you click on it. It gives you the addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, assessments. And then you just go down here to the placement grid. Um, and then it kind of delves into uh, what you're going to do. For example, if it's addition, um, if you look at this, you got set A, B, and C, and these are the smaller sets, 12 items, 12 items, 12 items. The one, four are all the items, right? So this would be all 36. And I have reciprocals in here. So it's actually 24, 24, 24, but they're reciprocals. So 12 with reciprocals. And, uh, and then I go to part, part, whole relationships which is using your fact triangles and then uh, going to these closed problems. And this is really helpful. We, we showed if we got kids the 40 digits correct per minute um, and they could do this and we taught them an add up procedure. Um, if they were above 40 digits correct per minute, they went to about 20 to 25 digits correct on subtraction without ever doing subtraction. If they were below 40, there was absolutely no generalization whatsoever. And so then obviously here's your uh, regrouping. And I call this procedural cover, copy, compare. I only put kids in these types of things once they're at 40 digits correct or above, and you'll be shocked how easy it is to teach kids these things. But again, it's all about getting those core math facts memorized. Once you do that, you fly through this other stuff fairly quickly. Okay. I'm not seeing any new questions. All right. Well, I will stick around if anybody uh, if anybody wants to sit and chat. Um, do I plan to publish this as an intervention program? I think I already. I think that's what I did. Yeah, we've got a lot of uh, one of the things for those who have been around for a while. Uh, intervention Central. This kind of reminds me of Intervention Central on steroids very specific and precise for math. It's a wonderful resource, just like tons of positive comments in the chat. That's one of the hopes that we have is that people will take things back and apply them at their school district. So I, I think that- Yeah, and, and Mary, yeah. And Mary, honestly, the large scale, uh, the large scale intervention program's already done. It's called Spring Math and it's excellent. Like I, I looked at it and I was just, you know, I was in amazement. And so uh, Dr. Vander Hayden's thought of everything. And again, if you could get districts to invest in that program, it will uh, blow their socks off. I have no doubts. Um, I'm, 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 the, I'm the poor man's math interventionist. My stuff's free and it's not quite as, com it, you know, it's not, not complex. And, and again, uh, Dr. Uh, Spring Math, I think they have built-in consultation and coaching and it's just lights, it's light years better than these kind of stuff, but uh, than my stuff, but uh, you know, my stuff is a really good bare bones, um, you know, place that if, if, if you can't get your school to invest in Spring Math, um, <laughs> this is, is the way it is, you know. I love it. These comments are great. Yeah, so it, it is. It's it's wonderful. I feel your pain back in the day. You're trying to find like math probes and how, you know, you're kind of building your own. And this is just such a wonderful resource. 
Yeah, what's this? I pitched it to my AOs. What's an AO? Might be academic officers. Yeah, the standards are different. Principles. Yep. Yeah, intervention central on steroids. All right. Well, everybody, um, any last questions before we display the code? Well, one of the things I want to add is to that point, um, you know, people will talk about how math fact memorization is incongruent with like a standards based curriculum. And again, I would just disagree with that wholeheartedly. I mean, it's like I said, um, I mean, I literally had a teacher just the other day tell me we don't teach memorization anymore. We teach strategies. And I was like, well, like what? And she's like, and, and, and I said, like, doubles plus one? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, don't they have to memorize the doubles? And she's, it just went over her head. And, and furthermore, you have to memorize the damn procedure. So I don't, I, I mean, again, it, it, like, think about making tens. And like, if you know six plus eight, and you know that six plus four is 10, and you know eight minus four is four, you can make tens mentally and totally understand it. Uh, like, the, remember the karate kid and Daniel son gets all mad because Mr. Miyagi's making him paint his fence and wax his car and saying this. And then he yells at him is like, you're not teaching me anything. And then he, he sends like a barrage of karate moves at Daniel son. And he just starts like muscle memory doing all this stuff. And it's like, that's what I try to get through to teachers. It's like, if you build this and you want to teach them strategies, it will take you literally like 30 minutes to teach doubles plus one, making tens and whatever else you want to do. Show them 10 frames because they already have the skill. And so you don't spend three months teaching a concept and having them count to death, which is what happens to kindergartners right and first graders you literally teach them the sub skills and then have them focus on what's this mean how can you represent this in different ways it's totally not against the standard it is helping the teacher actually do those standards i expect teachers to be teaching procedural fluency and conceptual understanding this provides the base for it and so when you have principals that want to thumb their nose up because it's fact drill uh, you got to be able to, you know, you have to have those discussions.